Hello Weiss players, welcome to Weiss Academy. So today here I have a guide to playing standby in Weiss shorts. Uh, so I've been a long time standby player and although I do play various styles of decks in Weiss, it, standby is one of my more favorite playstyles. So today I have a guide just explaining what is standby and how to get into building and playing a deck with the standby trigger in the game of Weiss shorts. <clears throat> so for our table of contents here, uh, we're going to first talk about what standby is, what kind of the playstyle is, so you can kind of see if it suits you or not, then some tips on how to build your deck, and as well as additional tips and tricks on getting started with playing standby. So this guide is aimed towards um, newer wise players or players who are not quite familiar uh, with how to play the standby guide. I'm not going to go super in-depth on any one specific standby deck as they are all different and have quite a few nuances to them. Um, so just a general overall guide to standby in white shorts. All right, first up, what is standby? So standby is a type of trigger currently only found in the red color. Uh, you can see them uh, characterized by the power button icon as well as having an additional uh, soul trigger on the climax. Uh, in the Japanese community, uh, standby triggers are referred to as the power button. They call them Dengen. So that's pretty funny, and I do agree it does quite resemble a power button. Uh, so what does it do? So when you play a standby climax, or if you trigger a standby climax, when your character attacks, you can resolve the ability where you may place a character from your waiting room whose level is up to one higher than your current level onto any slot on the stage in rested position. So what is, why is this beneficial? Well, you can place a character regardless of its play cost. Traditionally, characters in white shorts uh, are played usually at level 1 for zero cost, level 0 obviously for zero cost, but most decks don't play a lot of high cost in level 2s because they'd rather use their stock to play level 3s, which generally come with more beneficial effects. While for standby triggers, because you are playing the character from your waiting room without paying its cost, this enables you to essentially cheat out higher costed characters onto the stage uh, even at earlier levels. So this can enable a powerful playstyle where you play based on building a big powerful board that your opponent, if they're not playing standby or something, they're playing weaker characters from your hand, although for zero cost, right? But if they cannot contest your more powerful characters on the board, you're allowed to build up advantage by having those characters stay on the board over multiple turns. Um, so the existence of standby heavily influences deck building in the game. Uh, ever since standby became like a more competitive and viable play style, um, like other decks in the meta had to adapt to answer them. Um, so this can be for better or for worse. I personally appreciate the fact that standby introduces a more uh, varied deck building strategy and more varied gameplay into the game of white shorts so that not everyone's either playing like compression stall decks or they're playing some big combo deck trying to kill you as fast as possible, right? Uh, standby compared to those decks who are mainly trying to generate uh, resources in different ways. Uh, standby, you're more playing based on the board. You care more about power, which is a facet uh, in white shorts that most other decks did care about beforehand. So next, let's talk about some different play styles of within the standby archetype. Um, so the first one is generally what the community refers to as eight standby. So this means that you're playing all eight uh, triggers in your deck, your climax triggers, they're all standby triggers. So like I said previously, uh, if you're playing eight standby triggers, you're playing a completely different strategy than uh, traditional 1k1 decks where they're trying to accrue resources and push for damage because um, 1k1 triggers, they give you the plus soul when you play them for your climax combos. Uh, standby decks play a slower play style. You try to cheat out those big powerful characters and you try to have them survive on the board for multiple turns so that you can build advantage that way. Um, so that means that you want to win the board both on your turn but also on your opponent's turn as well. You don't want them to uh, reverse your characters that you got out, right? Because uh, otherwise if you have to play new cards or if you have to discard cards to kind of like encore those characters um, or even pay stock to encore those 
characters, you're getting less advantage. So ideally, you want them to be able to stay on board and your opponent cannot deal with them. And if this happens uh, through various turns, then you create a kind of snowball effect where uh, you can kind of uh, retain card advantage by having those characters stay on board. Uh, you can stop clock drawing so you can start taking less damage and because uh, you're winning the board your opponent has open lanes for you to swing into for more soul damage without investing resources and you can uh, also have a full board so that when they swing into you you also don't have uh, any empty lanes or maybe like one empty lane at most right so that's kind of uh, how the eight standby play style plays um, also in addition to the traditional uh, decks uh, Aside from being aggro, you could also play a variety of defensive options, which we will talk about later. Um, so some advantages and disadvantages to this playstyle. So like I said previously, um, if you are able to win the board and uh, you don't need to play down new cards every turn from your hand, uh, you can stop clock drawing early on into the game and conserve your life that way. Because uh, if you think about it, right, every time you clock, later on in the game, if you want to heal, most healers cost two stock. Um, so if you are able to stop clocking early and still maintain enough cards to play, that's a lot of extra advantage uh, in the game. Um, but because also because you're winning uh, the board, you're able to utilize uh, defensive options such as rest counters and anti-damage more effectively because those defensive options require you to have characters on board to be effective. Um, so that you don't leave empty lanes for your opponent to abuse, right? Uh, so in your more traditional decks, uh, it's less reliable to always win the lane, but in standby, since a lot of your cards have to do with uh, increasing the power and getting powerful characters on the board, uh, it's much more reliable in this type of uh, playstyle. Uh, additionally, uh, if you've ever played standby before, or if you're a new player and you start playing standby, you'll notice that uh, it's easy to accrue a lot of stocks since you're not really paying to, to play your characters and you don't have to like replay characters every turn. So with that extra stock, that also helps you uh, play out those defensive options while still having enough stock to be aggressive and play your finishers and whatnot. Um, again, uh, if you're winning your lanes, right, uh, you can consistently push for increased soul damage even without playing a climax. So for 1k1 decks, if they want increased soul, they have to play their climax to give everything plus one soul on the board. But if you're just winning your lanes and you have uh, empty lanes to swing into for the plus one soul every turn, you don't have to invest that climax for extra damage. Um, and then another facet of play standby is that you can kind of strangle your opponent for resources if they cannot contest or beat your board and they have to keep crashing characters in every turn. Uh, eventually, they can run out of cards to play. Although I will say this doesn't really happen as often anymore because more modern 1k1 decks just have so many uh, ways to gain card advantage. Uh, a lot of even non-climax effects, better brainstorms, um, and now climax uh, advantage combos, they generally don't require you you to reverse anything they could just plus on attack or some other condition so they don't really care about winning the board anymore so this can happen but i will say it's more rare uh in the modern white shorts um, metagame and then finally my last advantage point is if you get good at play standby i personally think it's an amazing pub stomper play style if you play at locals if you want to have a relaxing locals tournament or if you just want some easy wins um new players have a really difficult time beating standby decks because one, um, they haven't taken standby into consideration when building their decks. Uh, so they may not be playing answers to what you're playing in their decks at all, in which case they can't really do anything. Uh, additionally, uh, newer players struggle on valuing uh, like what to do in a game. So they don't know, oh, should I conserve resources here? Uh, what can I do to make my opponent um, basically lose resources while investing the minimal amount uh, that I can so I can still do my plays in the following turns. Um, so, you know, newer players aren't as efficient with that and therefore um, they kind of play into the snowball of standby quite a bit harder. And once you get that snowball going with eight standby, you are in a quite advantage position in the game. Um, okay, so then moving on to the disadvantages. I think uh, some disadvantages to playing standby is because you're playing those um, high costed, higher level characters in your deck, you're playing a quite a larger amount than um, traditional decks are. So you're more uh, 
vulnerable to bricking if you keep drawing those characters and you don't draw your like uh, level zero or level one utility cards um you're also more punished by early bricks because like i said it's a snowball based play style so if you can't get started early on um then it's uh, i'm not going to say it's impossible but it's quite a bit harder to come back later into the game since you need a few turns to get going um the other point is that you're more punished by uh any form of interaction or removal effects what i mean by this is like effects that uh basically remove characters off the board either by sending them somewhere else back to your hand uh, to the waiting room or whatever or like anti-change counters or um like suiciders or anti-change bombs any of those sorts you're more punished uh, by those effects because a traditional deck they don't quite care as all the cards they play generally generate them some kind of advantage and they don't cost anything to invest into on into playing onto the board compared to um a standby deck where your entire game plan is to uh, make that big board and have it stick. So having those effects being used against you is much more punishing compared to a traditional deck. Um, another point is that your standby climax, it doesn't provide immediate resource advantage or any soul bonuses. So this kind of play uh, goes back to the point of standby being a snowball play style. Uh, if you're falling behind and you want to like push for damage, unless you get lucky with your crit triggers, which to be fair, you do play a lot of in a standby deck, um, slamming down a climax doesn't really help you push for more damage in those situations, right? So it's uh you don't really have those huge um, comeback swings just by pulling down your climax. You still have to make that board first and then um, accrue advantage that way. Um, also, uh, if your opponent is able to contest your board and you have to spend resources to upkeep your board every turn, your climax does not um, generate hand advantage um, like the other climaxes do if you trigger them, right? Like if you trigger a choice trigger or like a gate trigger, they add cards directly to your hand. A standby trigger plays characters onto the board. If you have a full board, you have to lose another character that you already have on the board. So that's not a net positive. And if even if you do get a character onto an empty slot or you're playing over an already reversed character, if your opponent then answers that character on their next turn, then you haven't really gotten any advantage out of your trigger, right? So just be careful about that. Um, it's really easy to bleed cards uh, when you're not having a good game playing standby. Yeah, that's generally everything uh, I have to say about the 8 standby playstyle. All right, let's move on to the next one which is uh, just playing four standby. So eight standby and four standby are kind of the main uh, categories of playing standby decks. Um, I mean, technically you can play weird numbers of standby triggers, but generally you'll see either zero, four, or eight. For the four standby playstyle, this is a hybrid playstyle between standby and 1k1 decks. Um, some examples, if you play the Japanese metagame, are Kimono Friends and the Kaguya, which is in English as well. Um, so these standby triggers, they're, they do one of two things. They either, they're either they either tied to an important climax combo, such as in the situation of Kaguya, where you play the climax for an advantage combo, you play like a small standby package to get value out of your trigger, and then your other combo, you're not playing standby, so you're not like fully committed to that standby playstyle, but you can still get some advantages off of playing that trigger. Um, the other uh, thing is if you have some kind of value engine that you can cheat out with your standby trigger, you don't have to have a combo for it to be useful. And that's in the case of Kimono Friends, where they have a 2-1 that lets them uh, tap it to generate an additional stock every turn. So if you're able to cheat that out at level 1, then you can start generating stock early and it could get you advantages that way. So I believe their standby, uh, it's more of a vanilla standby trigger. They don't really use it for big combos or anything, but they have that value target that they want to get out as early as possible. Um, so these decks, um, they have a small standby package to kind of get value out of their standby trigger, but they're not completely um, committed into the, like, playing onto the board playstyle that 8 standby has. Um, so yeah, those are the two different types of standby decks. Um, next off, let's move on to the deck building. So 
Uh, building a standby deck is fairly different from building a traditional deck, and obviously you could just copy some deck list um, off the internet, but if you want to modify those lists, or if you want to like kind of start from scratch and build your own deck, here are some deck building tips and generally what kind of card profiles you see at each level in a standby deck. Um, so first off, we have the level zeros. So for level zeros in standby deck, you want to focus on utility and specifically costless utility is preferred. Um, so what I mean by costless utility is that uh, cards where you don't have to spend stock to get their effects off because um, you want level zero cards that can set you up for standby plays on your first turn where you don't have any stock to use. So for example, you can look at um, the Rougeard from Bushoku Tensei um, that one, you don't have to pay stock, but you could put a card from your hand to your clock to search your deck for any other card. So that's really useful in tutoring out uh, specific cards that you need uh, in any situation, even if you don't have stock. And it also accelerates you towards level 1, and as a standby deck, you kind of want to be uh, at level 1 faster than your opponent, because then you could start getting in level 2s with your standby trigger, and that's more valuable than just getting in some level 1s. Um, the next up, you can see the Toka profile in the middle. Uh, that profile is very powerful because it has two hand fix effects for zero cost and gives you a turn one discard outlet. So you can discard some level ones to your uh, waiting room at level zero. Uh, that you, if you hit a standby trigger or if you want to play a standby trigger from your hand, you can get those level ones in early. Um, and then thirdly, if you look at the Rimuru, uh, many standby decks will play a card like the Rimuru. Uh, which reads, uh, return this card to your hand, that's the cost, while your climax is played on your climax area, you may pay that cost and then choose one of your characters, and that character gets plus 2,000 power for the turn. So there are different varieties on these effects, right? Some effects let you um, give plus soul, some give power cross turn, some effects like let you scry top card of deck, but the key thing to these effects is that they're on cards that bounce back to your hand when you play a climax, um, and that's important since it's kind of like a free effect in a standby trigger. You can fill up your board by uh, having one of this card, and then you, when you play your standby, you bounce this card back to your hand so that you open an empty slot to get your standby character into, right? Because you don't really want to play over another character if you can, since um, that way you're kind of uh, not gaining any sort of advantage. You're trading out a card for another, which is fine in some situations, but getting the plus one is more beneficial, obviously. Um, and then lastly, uh, effect, any effect that lets you kind of look at the top card or cards of your deck and rearrange them or filter them out can be helpful because um, for standby decks, you generally don't want to trigger your standby trigger on the first check. Um, if you're able to get the standby trigger on the second or third trigger check when you attack, uh, this is beneficial because then, for example, you can uh, attack with a weaker character or a character you don't care about, you can even have them lose the battle and have them reversed maybe, but then when you trigger a standby on a later attack, you can play out a more powerful character over that character that you either already got its effect off or maybe got reversed and it's going to die anyways, then you can replace it with just something much better and you could get value out of your standby triggers that way. So because of that, you don't want to trigger check your standby on the first one, uh, because then if you have a full board, you either have to uh, replace the character, one of the characters in the front row, in which case you lose an attack, or you replace one of your characters in the back row, which are probably uh, assist characters with like beneficial effects that you don't really want to replace if you can, right? Sometimes you can upgrade and that's fine as well, but generally, again, you want to get your pluses and you don't want to just be trading out stuff. Alright, so that's for level zeros, just again, the focus is on utility, especially costless utility, um, to kind of get your standby engine rolling. Uh, next up, we have level 1s. So level 1s in standby decks, uh, many standby decks play generic uh, 1 stock cost level 1 characters. These characters are generally uh, 7.5k power and have some kind of encore. It can be hand encore, maybe clock encore, or maybe some kind of special encore rule. Uh, so these characters just are uh, powerful beat sticks that don't really do anything else, but they can stay on board and they can help you get over uh, your opponent's cards that you care about, such as like their 1-0 level 1 advantage combos that you want to uh, get rid of in case they like have multiple climaxes and can 
get more cards off of them, right? Um, so if you look at the Kirby in the middle, that's an example of one of those profiles. If you have two or more other uh, Day or Celestial characters, this gets plus one five power and hand on core. So it's at sitting at seven five. You could cheat it out at level zero with your standby trigger if you want, or if you play it uh, from your hand at level one, it only costs one stock, right? So it's not that much of a commitment to play this if you have to. So these characters are pretty nice to play in most standby decks. Um, so other standby decks that de definitely have better options though. So for example, the Mushoku Tensei deck, they're, they have a 7 5 one, one, um, that it doesn't have Encore, but it has a Climax combo that gets you advantage. And the Climax combo goes with a standby trigger. So obviously um, you want to be playing that instead of the traditional vanilla. Um, if you look at a deck like Hololive, they have a 1-0 uh, standby advantage combo. So you probably want to play that. Um, and Kaguya as well, right? They have a 1-0 uh, uh, standby advantage combo. So they opt to play those instead. Um, additional utility cards at level 1 are also welcome. Uh, so again, cards that help you... Uh, filter out your hand, cards that check the top cards of your deck, or even if you have the twin drive profile, the effect that lets you trigger check um, twice, that can help you trigger into more standby combos and lets you kind of build your board faster. So those effects are pretty nice to have. Um, if you look at the Roboco on the right side of the screen here, that card on play, you may discard a Hololive character to uh, check the top card of your deck and then salvage a level X or lower character from your waiting room. So it's hand filter, it's a discard outlet, um, lets you check the top card of your deck, and also when it attacks, you can give power to one of your er other characters. So for a standby deck where you care about power and making sure that your characters survive, this card just kind of has it all. It has so many beneficial effects on just that one profile. So, so something like that, that's an amazing card for standby at level one. Uh, moving on to level two. So for level two, um. This kind of generally consists of two types of cards. One is going to be your uh, two stock level two beat stick. And then also it's going to be the level where you play most of your backups or counters. So these two cost beat sticks, you play them in standby and not other decks because for two stock, other decks can spend that two stock playing out level threes. Uh, and level threes generally when they're played, they have an effect that lets you get more cards or they heal you, and level 2, 2 cost characters don't really do that. But for standby decks, is you can cheat them in at level 1 with your standby trigger, um, these are good to play in this type of deck style. And these are powerful beat sticks because 2 cost level 2 characters have 2 soul, so they do more damage than, uh, for example, your 1-1 one, one beat stick, which only has 1 soul, and they have high power on their bodies, and sometimes they even have utility effects on them. For example, um, the Nino uh, on the left here in Quintuplets, this card has Encore, so you can always keep it around. It gets a ton of power during your turn, which ensures that you win your lanes, and it also climax combos with one of your standby triggers. That's something that can be beneficial in your deck. In comparison, another good target is to the right here, the 2-2 yellow geld in slime. Uh, this card, it's a 9-5 power. It doesn't have Encore, but it has another effect um, that lets you, when your other character is attacked, front attacked I believe, you can send this card on stage to the waiting room to give that character plus 4,000 power. So this is an on-field 4,000 power backup. You can use that in combination with traditional backups or counters from your hand, which can make it very difficult for your opponent to kind of navigate your board. Uh, to make things worse off, uh, when you send this card to the waiting room for its cost, if you have um, extra stock, which Slime usually does because they play a stock generation level one combo, uh, you can pay three stock to stock Encore the scale back. So while it may not have a special Encore rule like Hand Encore, you can use the traditional three stock Encore to get it back after using the effect and you can use this multiple times in a turn. Uh, even more so if you get more than one copy of this onto your board. So you can like play a Climax, uh, get one of these onto the board. Maybe you triggered another um, standby Climax. You can get two guilds. And that just makes it very oppressive for your opponent to, to kind of deal with, right? And then 2-1 backups are nice to have uh, in standby decks because you do want to win your lanes uh, offensively and defensively. So uh, counters are nice to play just kind of as an insurance option so that your opponent doesn't beat out those uh, characters that you invested so much to get onto the field. At level 2, counters usually come with some kind of utility effect as well. Um, for example, you can pay 2, maybe 
uh, refresh your deck. You can uh, play an anti-change level 2 backup that lets you get rid of your opponent's uh, early play level 3s. Or something like um, the middle backup here, the Rudy uh, backup, which lets you pay for and discard another character to kind of uh, rest one of your opponent's characters on the board. So that's a super strong late game defensive option to make sure that your opponent doesn't kill you and end the game. So you get that one extra turn uh, to try to kill your opponent instead. Uh, so backups like these, very, very powerful and nice to have in a standby deck. And a standby deck very um, much kind of enables those backups to be powerful in turn as well, since you're playing to win out the board um, compared to traditional decks that a lot of times they're just like crashing in characters to generate resources and they don't really care about their board state right um okay so then next off onto the last level we have our level threes so uh level three options generally standby decks play a large variety of level threes and uh level threes are kind of like your toolbox so uh standby decks kind of peak at level two because uh, that's when you can start cheating in your level threes with your standby climax you, when you hit level 3, you can play level 3 characters from your hand, but it's not like there's level 4 characters you can cheat out with your standby trigger, right? So you can start getting out your level 3s at level 2, and a lot of level 3 cards that may not see play in traditional 1k1 decks uh, are can be good in standby decks. So some effects uh, include the Benimaru to the left here. Uh, this card has a continuous effect that just makes all your characters get more powerful, and when this card reverses their opponent, you can pay two to deal one damage to your opponent. So this doesn't require climax to do the burn effect. So it's just a nice generic uh, finisher uh, as the arm reverse effect works both turns. And since you're trying to win the board both turns, this works well with that. Um, it just kind of costs quite a bit of stock, but generally if you're playing the slime deck, you can make a ton of stock for free anyways. Um, and the fact that this gives all your characters extra power, uh, that also plays into kind of the standby board playstyle as well, right? Um, another traditional uh, profile that is played in standby decks is the 2k assist. So the example I have up here is kind of the Roxy in the middle. So 3-2, 2k assist, they usually have some kind of other beneficial effect as well. But these assists are just very nice to have um, in standby decks. Uh, usually, they're too high investment to go into because they cost too stock to play for a character that's just going to be giving extra power in the back row, right? But since you could get them out for free in standby, um, it can give your board a nice power boost as well. And this power stays um, cross turn. So that's very helpful to maintain your board. Um, especially going into level 2, since a lot of decks these days, they can just play out level 3s in the form of early plays, and these actually have decent power benchmarks to kind of start um, hitting your 2-2s two if you're playing standby. So having the 2k assist in the back can give you that extra edge for your 2-2s uh, two or maybe even 3-2s to survive your opponent's turn. And then most standby decks play four copies of some kind of climax combo finisher. These usually climax with a standby trigger, right? For example, the Nido on the right here, it can heal when you play from hand. So it's not bad to play from hand either. Um, if you get it in early, you can use the effect early if it survives maybe, or maybe you just cheat out an extra copy of your finisher. Uh, you can keep it safe in the back until you do hit level three to have that um, extra finisher to try to kill your opponent. Other level 3s with dice effects, um, you still do want to play early plays. Uh, while the goal of your deck is to cheat out characters from your waiting room with the standby trigger, you do generate a lot of stock over the course of the game. So you can start playing early play healers to kind of sustain yourself or other cards that uh, you can play from your hand. They have some kind of effect, maybe a removal effect for the standby mirror, uh, whatnot. So all these effects can be good. Um, and just as a one last example, we can take a look at this card, this Luna from Hololive. So this card normally would be a terrible card, um, but this card reads pretty insane in standby. Uh, so it gets minus three level on the stage, but the character facing this card cannot side attack. So it's not like they can side this for free damage. Um, although it is vulnerable to level zero bombs. So if your local metagame is playing a lot of zero bombs, maybe this isn't great. But if you don't see a lot of level zero bombs around, then this card can be quite amazing. Uh, additionally, right, uh, when it's front attacked, which they have to front attack it, it lets you check and wreck and kind of help you filter out non-climax cards to negate damage. And it also can uh, 
discard a hollow life character to burn your opponent for one damage when it reverses any character so you can do this during your turn you can do this when your opponent if your opponent cannot beat this card in battle on their turn as well so generic cards like this while they may not be played in other decks since they don't have an on play effect if you play it from hand they're quite strong in a standby shell so that kind of finishes off the kind of deck building section of this guide hopefully you found that helpful and it helps you get started making your own standby deck following up we just have some tips on how to play standby before we end off here so some things that you can look out for is one the general game flow so what is your game plan what do you want to do going into the game so at level zero you want to set up for your future levels that's why utility is so focused on in standby decks because you're not really trying to build a board at zero or you're not trying to push damage at zero you want to set up so that you are more successful at level one at level two um, so one key point here is that don't overcommit to the board um, because if you play a ton of level zeros and they get reversed during your opponent's turn you have to play more cards to kind of uh, keep attacking every turn um, so i think for standby a lot of times uh, one attack maybe two attacks at level zero uh, per turn is completely fine you kind of want to play out slow make sure that you don't bleed too many cards from your hand and it's also more preferable for you to hit level one first compared to your opponent because then you can start getting your level twos in before they even hit level one and that can be very difficult for your opponent to deal with so you don't really want to hit them for a bunch of damage either you just want to kind of uh, make it so that the damage is, the discrepancy isn't like too large um so then next off after level zero at level one level one is kind of where you start getting the more valuable standby targets in uh in uh the case of your two twos because the two twos they have more power and more soul damage compared to getting in your level ones so it's not bad to get in uh one level one at level zero but it's not the end of the world if you can't do that either uh you always want to save a standby climax to play at level one because what you really care about is getting in those two 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 soul beat sticks at level one uh, so always save a standby cx for that i would say then when you hit level two again that's when your trigger peaks in value since you can start getting level threes and level threes are the highest level characters that white shorts goes to uh, so you want to get to level two preferably not too behind your opponent and then you want to stay at level two for like multiple turns generally right obviously sometimes you can't help it you take a bunch of damage and you hit level three but if you can stabilizing at level two is very powerful for a standby deck and then at level three uh, i would say the main thing that differs between playing standby and playing other 1k1 decks is that don't automatically go towards full committing on your finisher and trying to kill your opponent as quick as possible uh, most, in most cases you actually want to prioritize survival because the finishers in standby they're not as powerful as other dedicated combo decks right so uh, you really have to analyze the situation right uh, if you don't think you can survive another turn or if you think you have a really good chance of uh, killing your opponent then yeah sure go for it but if you have doubts then maybe it's better to play defensively especially if you have those defensive counters such as the rest counter in Mushu Tensei, the minus soul counters you can find in uh, standby quintuplets and data life if you have those available to you a lot of times it might be better to just play defensively uh, heal down and save enough resources to use those defensive options to give yourself another turn um, so really think about the situation and judge what is the best course of action all right <clears throat> and then just some additional tips first when you start the game for mulligan you do want to discard a standby target so preferably a level one standby target sometimes uh for me i personally discard a level zero if i have multiple zeros in my hand i can afford to discard one uh, just in case i trigger a standby at level zero so i have something to grab off of the trigger um, sometimes if you have a good hand it's okay to keep multiple climaxes in hand for example uh, you draw like two climaxes um and you have a level zero that can hand filter you can keep those climaxes in your hand you don't always have to discard them right because you can play a climax at level zero to get level one in and you can play another you do want to have another cx to play at level one to get your level twos in right so unless you're absolutely flooding it's generally pretty okay to keep around two climaxes in your hand uh starting in the game and then the next really important uh piece of advice is always clock your standby targets for the next level so what i mean by this is while you want to discard your level ones uh, at level zero so you can stand by them in 
for uh, level 2 targets, you can clock them in your clock at level 0. While you level up, they will go to the waiting room and they're ready for you to grab off your triggers. Um, and same for level 3s, right? Level 3s, you can clock them in your clock at level 1. And then when you level up, in most cases, uh, they'll go to the waiting room. And hopefully, you won't be refreshing so you can like get them back out from the waiting room. Um, so it's always important to consider clocking those important targets so that you're set up for the next level. Another thing is to also pay attention to the cards that uh, you trigger into your stock. I know this can be hard to kind of memorize what cards you have in your stock, but maybe some key cards such as important level 3s in your stock, you want to keep track of those so that you know if you refresh and then you pay out that stock, you can have some of those key standby targets in your waiting room. The next tip of advice is, uh, I've said this several times already, is always consider not clock drawing early on. So after you make your board and your board uh, has stuck, uh, you don't have to spend cards to play new characters every turn. So you can um, get back the cards in your hand by uh, just drawing every turn and maybe brainstorming. Uh, so if it's not necessary to clock, uh, co really consider not clocking, sometimes even at level 1 or level 2. But of course, um, Make sure that you have that board established first, right? So after you establish the board, then you could consider this. Um, but if you need to like find a specific card, or if you need to like go through more cards in your deck to mill out and refresh, then yeah, clock drawing can be uh, beneficial in those situations. But just keep that in mind. Sometimes it's better to not clock draw early on compared to other decks where you're pretty much always clock drawing until like level three, right? Then the last thing I do have to say before we end off here is always consider the consequences of overextending. Um, so I mentioned overextending at level zero where you're just playing down too many cards to attack with. You generally don't want to try laying level zero uh, because you want to maintain those cards in hand as your standby trigger. They don't really plus you in hand super hard early on. Um, and then always consider committing too hard to the board to, for example, uh, win a lane. Sometimes, especially in the mirror match, it's uh, better to side attack to kind of maintain your board. So if you side attack, your characters are always guaranteed to survive. Then on your opponent's turn, if you have like backups or counters in hand, you can then utilize your defensive options and your opponent cannot, right? So if you have a 2-2, you want to swing over your opponent's uh, also 2-2 or maybe early play or something, but you know they have a backup in hand, Sometimes it's better to kind of just side attack there, conserve your board, and then on your opponent's turn, they then have to consider the same in their situation. If they attack into you, then you can use your defensive counters to kind of beat them out, and whoever kind of runs headfirst into the other, they're going to lose their board. Uh, of course, um, if you want to push for damage and you don't care about your board, like if you're late into level 2 or heading into level 3, then yeah, um, just running into your opponent's characters to try to push for damage and then just playing out level 3s from your hand the next turn, that's fine as well. It really depends on the game state. But side attacking can definitely be a powerful tool, so always uh, reconsider being defensive versus aggressive when you're playing a standby playstyle. Um, so that wraps up the standby guide for today. It was a bit of a longer one. Hopefully you learned something from it. If you're a new player, I hope you could try out this playstyle and be successful. It's definitely not for everyone, but uh, definitely give it a try and let me know what you think.